really do think Solana is like extremely optimized for a, a payments layer. The locality of free markets plus atomic composability and like that instant finality in a sense, right? Like it's super fast. Those are like the three key things that you need. It's a very, very strong narrative that L2s fundamentally can't really compete on structurally because of the bridging, right? That is like one of the main benefits of a giant global state machine, which is that payments are much less of a headache for everybody involved, including the developers. Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. All right, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. You've got another weekly roundup with Mert and myself. Uh, we'll be discussing all things Solana and probably bleeding into the Ethereum side this week. Uh, 4844 was a couple of weeks ago. We've been following that quite closely on the show. Got some updates around you know, how we've seen transaction fees change on L2s and sort of like what that ecosystem looks like. Um, and then some other interesting updates on the L2 side. Uh, but let's kick things off, Mert, with starting on Solana. Solana has been filled with, with transaction volume lately. And because of that, we've seen a rise in the amount of failed transactions. So maybe if I can throw it to you to kick it off with just explaining uh, like what a failed transaction is, what a dropped transaction is, and what the difference between the two are. Uh, and then we can kind of talk about some statistics around that. Sure, yeah. This is a relatively complex topic, in, but I'll, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. So I'll start from the point of view of the user. So let's say you are a just on your phantom wallet. Maybe you go on Jupiter and you connect your wallet, you make a swap, and there are three things that can happen, okay? One is the trade goes through successfully, right? Transaction successful, all is good. Two, uh, or the second, is you make the transaction and it fails, and then it shows you in your wallet that, hey, this failed, okay? And the reason for that generally, especially if you're on Jupiter, is because your slippage uh, was exceeded, right? So let's say you, you said your max you're good with is 5% slippage, but let's say you're aping some shitcoin and the price moved way more, more than that within the time from clicking the button and for the uh, transaction to execute. The smart contract sees this, it sees your slippage tolerance and says, okay, no, I'm going to fail this because the user does not want this, right? So that's actually intended so that you don't get worse execution. Okay, and then the third reason this can happen or, or the third thing that can happen is you make the transaction and it doesn't appear anywhere. And that means the transaction was actually dropped and the app that you're using should communicate this to you because they can tell. Uh, so those are the three options, okay? Um, now, obviously, going to ignore the successful case here. The interesting cases are the, the second and the third case, because those are both technically failed transactions, but they're actually completely different things. So when you see the charts on the internet that say something like, here's a red chart, and it says 50 to 70% of transactions on Solana fail. Okay. What that's actually saying uh, is, these, there's a lot of bots on Solana that try to capture arbitrage opportunities, right? So there's like an arbitrage opportunity and there's maybe a hundred bots. They all race. Okay. Once the arbitrage is captured, those bots are like, wait a minute. Now there's no point for me to uh, uh, execute this trade. I'm going to fail on purpose, right? So that it's not a bad execution for them. Um, and that's actually the source of pretty much all of uh, the failed transactions is because our bots are trying to get arbitrage on chain. And the, the, and while it's technically accurate to say, you know, X percent of transactions fail, what's actually inaccurate is to say the following things. One is you can't say that this is like fake TPS or something. And the reason is because the failed transactions still take up the exact same path or the, take the exact same path as a successful transaction. They get executed on the validator. They consume fees. They consume block space. They go through the exact same pipelines. So in terms of a systems point of view, like if you're just looking at it from a, as a systems engineer, 
the load, scale, throughput uh, characteristics are all the same. Okay, so you can't say like oh, this is like a lightness failure or something that doesn't make sense. And then people will uh, actually use that chart to say, well, the user experience is bad, but that's actually not true because the vast majority, and I believe it's like 92% of that chart is bots. So it's actually what you're seeing is not what users are seeing. Okay. Users might be seeing the drop transactions, which is a totally different thing because they wouldn't have made it to that chart to begin with. Right. So to recap, the chart on its own is just some set of data, but you can interpret it in a few ways. And the way people are interpreting it from, let's say, the Cardano and Al Algorand camps of crypto Twitter are saying that this is like a system failure. It's not. It's literally intended by the smart contract. And they're saying it's bad user X experience, but it's also not because you can actually run the numbers on this. Only about 8% of user transactions actually fail. Okay, they might get delayed, um, but only about eight actually, because you can see this with the signers. Um, the actual problem that's going on that, that you can infer from that chart is that spamming the chain costs the arbitrage bots little to nothing so they will keep doing it, okay? That is the takeaway from that chart. And so uh, that's the problem, of course, the problem, and, and it needs to be fixed. But like, for example, even um, if you just go back to maybe the Jito airdrop, like when the network wasn't as congested, the failure rate was still around 50% then as well. Right? People don't realize this, but the failure rate has been this high for quite a long time, but people weren't falsely conflating it with the user experience that you see today, which is actually a completely different thing. That is, and, and so I'll get to that now, which is the third thing, which is the user transactions getting dropped altogether. Okay, so that's the problem there is with the networking layer of Solana, right? Um, on Ethereum, the transactions go to some mempool. They might get stale. And if they get stale, obviously, they're probably not going to be included in the block or right. it doesn't really make sense for the block builders for that economic activity. The incentives don't make sense. On Solana, the blocks are built continuously, meaning there's a block leader that says, hey, send me all your transactions now. And that's what happens. There is no like discrete auction that takes place. And since that can happen, people spam the, leaving, the, 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 the living shit out of the block leader, like insane spam. Um, and what that does is um, it overwhelms the leader such that it doesn't, it, it doesn't make, let's, let's say, the right choices in packing the block. And so transactions that might have a higher fee will actually get dropped, especially if like a bot was faster to get to it than a user. And there's a lot of problems there at the, at the networking layer, the quick layer. And that is actually that problem. But that's a totally separate problem. And to be clear, for users, that is obviously, it doesn't matter what we call it. It's a bad experience regardless. Uh, and obviously, that's true, right? Uh, we're, we're super cognizant of that. And there are quite a few fixes going live. Um, actually, some minor patches are going live pretty regularly as well. Some of them even running on the Jito client, which doesn't need the Anza client. Um, but it's important to understand that when, when you see a failed transaction on a block explorer or a wallet, that means it actually made it onto the chain. It just failed for the exact purpose that the smart contract developer told it to fail, right? If I want to call the circles program for USDC, let's say, and say, give me all the money, the transaction might go on chain, but Circle's going to be like, no, you don't have the right permission for this. I'm going to fail this transaction, right? That's just how that works. Um, but in any case, these are all being fixed, and I think it'd be fun to come back to this in, in, within a few months once the networking layer has been improved a bit and there's better economic uh, uh, incentives for not spamming the chain. Okay, so I, I like the, the context you set there. And so... There's two scenarios. One, let's start with the third, which is the, the one you just touched on, um, which is drop transaction. That, that is very much so a poor UX design, uh, issue that Solana is dealing with. And when, like, I've had this problem, uh, other people have had this problem, and, like, most people, especially, like, you think of, like, a very simple, plain user, they don't want to have to know whether their transaction failed or was dropped. Like, that shouldn't even matter to them. Uh, this should be like a very core level, pro protocol level problem. And 
Uh, I think it is for the most part, with except for the the frequency at which people are experienced drop experiencing drop transactions. And so, my question to you is why. Uh, during certain periods, do we see s- increases in um, dropped transactions? Like, let's say there was uh, a very popular NFT mint uh, that was like everybody was spamming to get into this NFT mint. And I would just want to send, um, you know, one of my friends USDC. So I had nothing to do with this uh, NFT mint. Would the likelihood that my transaction gets dropped, uh, assuming that I was sending my transaction at the same time as this NFT mint, would the likelihood that my transaction gets dropped increase? During this NFT mint, relative to the, like just a random point in time when things were relatively um, at, at an equilibrium of activity. So the, what it's dependent on is the connections that the block leader has. So if you think of the block leader, let's say it's Coinbase Cloud. Okay, it's going to be proposing a nice block, it's accepting the transactions and connections from everybody. Um, if there are bots that are abusing those connections, like let's say there's opening them, closing them, opening them, closing them, opening them, closing them, et cetera, such that they're overwhelming the block leader uh, or saturating those and pruning the other valid ones. Like there's some bugs there, uh, then it doesn't matter. Your transaction likelihood or inclusion likelihood is going to, it's just chance at that point. It's like, did I land it at that exact window where the connection was like, was it pruned? Did it get, in, get there in time? Um, like how long, what was the network paying? Like there's a bunch of different factors there that kind of contribute to the overall outcome. But that's the core issue, which is the connections to the validator, the, the block leader. And so it matters. Um, the connections that I like matter to me are the ones, okay, so like I route through Phantom, uh, which basically uses the RPC that I select on, you know, my my application UI, most likely. And so... The connections that would be relevant to me as the user is my selected RPC, it, their ability to get my transaction to the leader. Is that correct? It's it's kind. I mean, there's a point there, but it's not totally that simple. Your RPC, what they will do is they will forward the transaction to the block leader and the next three block leaders. Um, and so they have to open a connection for that to happen. Maybe maybe they forward to a relay or something. Um, and, but if somebody else is already abusing those connections, it's, it's, there's no deterministic way to guarantee that you will win those connections. Now, uh, what you can do is you can open up a staked connection. A staked connection does get prioritized and you get up to X percent bandwidth based on your stake that you have for that connection. And so you do have like X of a say, let's say. But uh, there's some bugs in that, so it doesn't work exactly as you might imagine. And so then you mix, you put it all together, right? You have network jitter, you have these kind of implementation bugs, and you have these dynamic uh, competition uh, uh, races, let's say. And the end result is like, okay, we're not exactly sure who is going to win this. Like there's no, it's very difficult to say. What we do know is you can abuse the system. And when you abuse a system like arbitrage bots do, because they don't care, all they care about is, right, because they can span the chain a billion times per day and cost like, I don't know, let's say a few hundred dollars. They just need to land that one transaction to make like $600,000. So that, that incentive is totally off. Um, and so what, what, what we're doing now and what we're testing this out with like Jito, for example, and then Solana Labs itself or Anza, um, slow patches to the networking layer. A uh, fire dancer actually already has like a, a, a network layer that would that would help fix this. Obviously, that's kind of far out right now, but um, they actually already. I think Richard tweeted. Richard is one of the people on fire dancer that if if they were to use a networking stack provided by fire dancer, these problems would mostly be alleviated, hmm. anyways. So um, that's the issue that we're we're trying to solve right now. And it's the reason it's not consistent is because obviously these bots. Uh, especially they are active during meme coin season where there's like a pool on radium and they can just go there. And if they're the first, they can just dump on everybody after, right? So that is an important race. But if new tokens aren't being launched, let's say, they don't have an incentive to do that. And if they don't have an incentive to do that, then users get more of a a better experience on the network. Gotcha. Okay, then let's back up to the failed transaction state. And so 
when you, a regular user experiences this problem, I think I think you laid out why bots experience this problem quite clearly, but I want to dive into when a regular user experiences this problem because I don't think this is a Solana specific problem. I think it's just amplified because of some interesting dynamics of Solana. So let's start with like how yeah, let's start with Solana. So if you go to the Jupiter front end or the radio front end or whatever, and you go tr- try to place a trade, you will set your slippage tolerance and default to just generally for like a half percent if it's not like auto. And if you send a half percent slippage swap to try to buy, you know, Geo Bowden or whatever it may be, that you have to think about the amount of liquidity versus that that that, that pool has, right? And so we have these like, 200 plus million dollar meme coins that are sitting on like sub $2 million of liquidity. And so you have extreme volatility in the prices of these tokens, extreme volatility. And so when you try to place a swap with a half percent slippage, there is a very good chance that by the time you get that transaction to the leader, that you have exceeded your slippage and say the price that I was willing, the lowest price I was willing to accept has now moved. And now my transaction is no longer valid. And so that is why a user would would see this. And because, so like, if you look at the liquidity profile of Solana meme coins relative to something like an ETH mainnet meme coin, it is like, it's completely different. And I don't necessarily have a good take as to why that that dynamic has played out. But you see sub one percent on um, liquidity to total market cap of a lot of these meme coins, and you really you don't tend to see this on. Um, on like even even the even the ETH L twos like there was a meme coin that just launched on base the other day uh, where the like the person who launched it burned a half million dollars of Ethereum of ETH to to launch this and put it in the LP and you just do do not see that on Solana they are much smaller more rapid there's way more of them and I, that probably is just a, a nature of like if you're someone who's launching these meme coins you have the ability to launch a large number of these rather than like a selective few um, and you know we looked at the stats a couple episodes ago. There was like 8,500 new meme coins a day. Um, and so because of you have these very low liquidity profiles, you see these extreme price volatility, this is extreme price volatility. And that is why your slippage will often get hit, which kind of this is you now roping in the Jito discussion we've had. Like this is why people were just saying, all right, screw it. I'd rather just get my transaction in. I'll set five to 10% slippage and just know I'm getting that price. And like, that's what the trader was okay with because they wanted to get their trade executed. Um, and so. It is interesting to kind of see the dynamics play out. And so, because I agree with you, like a failed transaction for that reason is not like necessarily a bad user experience for for, like from the chain's perspective, like the user made a request and the chain delivered on that request that it was the request itself setting a very, like a, a very, uh, a tight slippage on a very volatile asset. That was the thing that was bound to fail. Um, and so I get why it gets dunked on quite a lot. Uh, and I, I want to get your take on if the, because I guess we kind of touched on this, but Hajito turning off their mempool, uh, I think that was March 8th. We did see like a slight uptick in the amount of failed transactions. I'll go ahead and share a screen here. We, so March 8th is here and we did see a slight, like there was a spike, there was a spike in the number of failed transactions. And so I can't like, you know, it's not to new all time highs. It's not to some exuberant number but one of the fears of turning off the mempool was like all right if you know some of these bots will just go back to spamming um it's hard to say that's really happened yes or no um and i guess to give more context to the viewer here here's the ratio of failed transactions that we have in orange uh to successful transactions here in blue um so but this is on a 180 day time frame so 180 goes 180 days ago we were in the neighborhood of about 40% 40% failed and now are higher up towards that 70% fail. And specifically on March 8th, um, you did see this start of this move lower from about um, you know 50% failure to closer to 70. So it does seem like there was some uptick. Uh, I haven't done the the work at all outside of like this quick query uh, to to see what the difference was. Like, and we're still seeing a lot of activity in in the Jito block engine as far as searchers providing tips to validators. So I'm just curious, like. How did the removal of the mempool change this landscape in your mind? Well, I think if you ask the Jito team, or really even just myself, it's not that clear that it's the mempool that's causing, or let's say that is the main catalyst 
Um, there is just generally more activity. I believe Lucas had a chart with the number of tokens being launched actually increasing, which might actually be a different part of this picture, which represents it more accurately. So it's super difficult to tell these things, I think. Um, so anything I would just say would be like a tarot card reading, I believe. Uh, but, you know, maybe if you... But going back to your point about... Uh, yeah, so like I, I tell people, like, okay, this is happening because of uh, uh, slippage, right? This is a liquidity problem. And people dunk on me and, and, and whatnot. And it's like, okay, um, the, the one counter argument you could make is maybe the slippage problem wouldn't be there if the transaction was included in the block as soon as possible. Um, it's like, okay. But again, that now that goes to the networking issue that I was talking about. So it's actually a different thing. Um, and also, like, I do think most people on Solana are relatively unsophisticated compared to Ethereum, where, like, look, if you're trading on Ethereum mainnet and you're willing to pay $20 for a swap or whatever, you probably know what you're doing, kind of, that you're willing to pay that price. On Solana, since it's so easy, right, that's, there's two sides of accessibility. There's, you get everybody involved, but everybody, you don't self-select for the people who are going to like uh, be sophisticated enough to understand some of these nuances, right? Like most people on Solana probably didn't even know what slippage was, honestly, uh, if I'm being honest. Like highly, just from based on what I've seen. Um, and like most people trade through like these TG bots anyways, which have like really bizarre settings. Um, so I think there's a lot of in 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 maybe c compared to like web 2 i think there's a lot of blame on the underlying web 3 system itself like the blockchain as opposed to like any sort of criticism on the app layer i just don't see that that often right like people directly blame like either the rpc or the system or the blockchain right away but i i rarely see people just questioning the app itself and it's like actually the app has much more control over the ux Right. Than you might think, right? That's kind of the point of the app. Um, so, anyways, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I want to quick. I want to keep moving, um, just because we, there is a lot of interesting things to talk about. But one of the things that we discussed was um, the where these errors are occurring. So I quickly threw together this query. Uh, that shows like the contract that the error. So this looks at every failed transaction, and then. Uh, for a given period, it's just pulling the two contracts that have, or the two instructions uh, that has the the, the most tra failed transactions in a single day. Um, so it's looking at the uh, instruction error on the executing account within the instructions. And so I show this because uh, you'll see two rows for every day. So the 25th has two rows, 24th two rows, and so forth. Uh, this is a radium contract, and this is a Jupiter contract. So, uh, to your point, the top two slippage or the top two most failed accounts every day have to do with slippage. And so, it is it is a nod in the direction of hey, like uh, this probably is the app layer's issue, and you know that we need to see more on their end to fix it. Uh, and then, so that is like the the failure on the where the transaction is landing. Now, the other side of this is who is sending the transaction. Uh, and so this is the, say, again, looking at only failed transactions and saying uh, the breaks it that the, the total transactions into two groups, the failed transactions from the uh, the signers that had the most transactions, it puts them in the top 50 uh, and then takes everybody else. So 50 accounts make up the uh, this orange segment here and everybody else with the failed transactions in a day uh, makes up this blue segment here. And it's about 50-50. So again, to your point, these are all bots. Uh, that are experiencing these failed transactions at scale. And so it is causing a problem on the network. We do need to fix the networking layer, uh, and it, but it isn't this, it's not the average user that is the one experiencing these problems, although they still do. And that is the point that I think is, is the hardest because even me as someone, like I've had failed transactions on or dropped transactions on just trying to send USDC and like that is super frustrating. That is the really poor UX point that needs to get fixed immediately. Um, Fee mechanism needs to kind of change the the that there's that's being discussed, and of course, what uh, the 1.18 upgrade 
is coming to fix the scheduler, help solve some of that jitter problem. So fixes are in, are in order here, but I do think it's important to kind of put the context around this. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, I guess we can kind of move on from the failed transaction side of things into some brighter news, which is Circle announced that they have launched their CCTP program on Solana. And so you can now seamlessly bridge from Solana to all of their connected chains, which is most of the L2s and Ethereum, as well as the Cosmos ecosystem through Noble. That is a huge uh, advancement, and I'm excited to run the, the data on that. I haven't had a chance yet today. I was hoping to do it before this, but uh, I'm excited to see like how those flows come through and, and really what that changes, but curious on your take on getting the CC, Circle CCTP integration live on Solana. Yeah, I think, well, obviously I'm quite biased here, but I, I have worked in payments or digital payments I would say most of my working career in, in some regard, like mostly banks and startups with payments and then Coinbase, did some payments at Coinbase as well, actually. Uh, and obviously I work with them today. I, I think, I really do think Solana is like extremely optimized for a, a payments layer, right? Because the locality of free markets plus atomic composability uh, and like the other instant finality in a sense, right? Like it's super fast. Those are like the three key things that you need. Um, and Solana has those. And you can see this, like, th there are stats on Solana's stable volumes, like USDC, which are a little inflated. Uh, actually, not a little inflated. They're definitely inflated uh, because uh, I believe there's Artemis has some stable volumes that count Phoenix's orders that are canceled, which don't really mean stable volume. Uh, but even disregarding that, there's still quite a bit of, of stable volume, especially USDC. And I think USDC folks know this. Like, I think um, I, I tweeted this morning something like um, Solana is the best chain for payments. And a, a Circle director, uh, Peter, said USDC on Solana will replace inefficient payments everywhere. Right? Uh, and and that, is, that is true because uh, payments are like hilariously inefficient. I don't know if people understand how payments in, in, in real life work, but like they're so stupid. Uh, it, it's, it is like, in fact, uh, this is actually one of the stories for why I started building crypto in the first place. I was building payments, um, uh, a digital card for entrepreneurs at one of my former positions. And we need to send money to Australia. And to send to Australia, you need to like route the money through like all these different weird jurisdictions. I was like, what the hell is that? I was like, why do I need to like play this weird graph game? where I can just directly transfer it through the blockchain like right away. And they're like, oh, no, the blockchain's a scam. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, it clearly solves this problem. Um, so that's, that's like a fun story. But so like, um, obviously, you know, people have their thoughts on USDC, like, oh, well, it's not true decentralized. It's like, no, like, obviously it's not. It's, it's literally a centralized entity. That's obvious. That does not mean that it's, Crypto isn't just for, um, uh, uh, there's obviously a lot of cypherpunk ideals that motivate a lot of us, but that is not the only purpose of crypto. Uh, it also helps people gain economic freedom, right? As Coinbase would say, uh, I can send money to my dad with USDC in Turkey with basically no uh, fees and instantly via Solana, right? I think that's like really underrated and it's pretty awesome. Um, and so overall, it's really good to see like this cascading uh, effect of news. Like obviously first was Visa uh, with Solana and then there was Shopify Pay and then Paxos and PayPal uh, are piloting their stable on Solana as well. And then now this, and then there's token extensions which give like stable coin issuers a lot of leverage as well. And so it'll be interesting to see um, that narrative play out. I do think it's a very, very strong narrative that L2s fundamentally can't really compete on structurally because of the bridging, right? That is like one of the main benefits of a giant uh, global state machine, which is that payments um, are much less of a headache for everybody involved, including the developers. Yeah, as someone who uh, recently is in the process of buying a house, so I'm probably a market top, just a, just a red, waving the red flag there. Uh, the actual process of getting money from a bank account, from your bank account into someone else's bank account is, is brutally painful. Um, 
I ended up dropping off a, a handwritten check because that was actually the easier right, the route than going through this whole process of just enabling wire transfers on a particular account. An absolute nightmare of an experience. And so that it really is the refreshing point of like, it's that breath of fresh air. You're like, all right, some of this shit is actually worth the time we're putting into it. Um, and I, I agree with you that the base layer should be like this maximally decentralized, um, maximally is subjective, uh, but this decentralized base layer that is censorship resistant and that can like, you know, stand the test of time while being a scalable and useful layer uh, that enables anything to be built on top of it. You get the optionality to do whatever the hell you want on top of it. Um, some of that may be good. Some of that may be bad. Some of that may, may be intentionally malicious. Uh, but that is what the, the point of the base layer is to not say, hey, you can do this and you can't do this and like have these opinionated claims as to what gets built on top of. And so of it, and you're going to see centralized things get built. And I think that's very useful. But I guess one thing I want to quickly touch on before we jump uh, ship here is in the, in the name of being able to do anything you want on uh, a, a open and permissionless blockchain, you can have questionable things being done. We had a recent uh, meta, if you will, of like racist and ob obscenely offensive meme coins getting launched on Solana. Uh, and there's been some very negative pushback towards that is because it's a question of like, these are, are obviously not bad. This kind of stuff happens on social media. It's not like a blockchain phenomenon that people are being rude uh, and offensive. Like that is, that exists everywhere in, in real life, face to face, and especially online when people can just kind of hide behind screens. Um, there's been a debate around like, should these be censored at, on the, the front end level? Again, the application level. And like, curious what your thoughts are on this whole new series of events that have unfolded. I think probably what's happening is there's like probably like three or four bored kids in Eastern Europe that are just like, ah, ha, ha, this is hilarious. Uh, I think that's what's happening, right? I don't, I don't think people are like coordinating hate attacks or anything. That's not happening. I think it's just kids being stupid uh, or just really weird people. Um, and then it's obviously people love to uh, talk about random things on the internet. Uh, and so then everybody's amplifying it. And the more attention you give it, the more it multiplies. And it's obviously a touchy subject. Uh, rightfully. And so it ends up being very, very, uh, and then, you know, like the memo camps will say like, oh, this is now hate speech and like the like make doctored things because they need to get their engagement. Uh, and so it just keeps going on like that. But like, then it opens up the conversation like, okay, fundamentally a blockchain by its definition is a decentralized censorship resistance platform. Okay. And that works. So if people want to publish something they should be able to publish whatever they want, okay, um, on the blockchain network. However, uh, publish, publishing something and distributing it are completely separate things, right? Like I can, in my own house right now, say whatever illegal things that I want uh, to say, right? I can make all sorts of hateful speeches, whatever. Um, and I, can, I have the right to do that. But of course, I don't have the right to say, hey, come listen to me, do this, okay? Uh, if people are like, no, I don't want to do that. That's, that's how that works, right? They don't want to do that. Okay. So, uh, so if you, if you actually believe in freedom and you take freedom to its eventual premise, then the other people have a freedom to not actually, uh, uh, serve what you want them to serve, right? I don't care about your ideological stance. Um, if you actually are a libertarian, if you actually care about free markets, right? If I'm a front end and I see a piece of content and I'm like, wait a minute. I do not, it is in my interest that I do not show this to people, uh, maybe because I don't believe in it, or maybe because I, I, I strongly disagree with it, or maybe because of, of profit reasons. I don't, the, the point is, it does, really does not matter what that reason is. The point is that I can do that because it's a free market and I'm an independent entity. And so I, I'm just not going to show it. Now, if people want to show it and they think they can get distribution that way, sure, do that, right? Like, you'll obviously have to deal with the necessary regulation, law, whatever, of, of that entity. Um, but in a free market, people can do whatever they want. Um, and so I, I think people should be able to publish what they want. But, you know, uh, I think everybody pretty much agrees with this, that, like, you can publish what you want, but you don't, and that's free, but like, distribution is not free. Distribution is something you have to earn and, and, and get. Um, so that's really my two cents on it. Dan Romero from the creator of Farcaster and Warpcast kind of has the same approach, right? That they are building the protocol layer as well as a front end that sits on top of that. Say whatever you want at the protocol layer, but we have like rules and regulations and things that we need to abide by in our own morals 
And we will filter out hate speech on Warpcast. Like that, a no brainer. That seems like a very logical pursuit path. And I think that's kind of the, uh, honestly, the mappings are, are pretty similar between that and the meme coin trading. So uh, not surprised to see that. I think it's the right thing to do. And I'm, I'm kind of happy to see that being taken care of. Um, yeah. Yeah. Moving on to our next topic, Solana versus Ethereum fees. I'm going to go ahead and share a screen again here using the Artemis dashboard uh, just to show how the progression of narratives changes over time. So Ethereum has always been focused on this, not always, but recently been focused on this ultrasound money narrative, um, mostly related to the fact that it generates a lot of fees and a large portion of those fees are, are burned and therefore like distributed amongst the holders equally. A lot of that, a lot, a lot of the ETH maxis, I'll say, and I won't put the whole ideology into the into this camp here, but a lot of the the pushback from you know some of the very hardcore ETH maxis was, hey, you know, sure Solana is building uh, this super fast blockchain, but nobody uses it, and it'll never generate meaningful fees. Um, you fast forward to today, and there's it turns out that <laughs> Solana is only a few multiples away from uh, Ethereum and fees, which is quite interesting. We've seen this this narrative shift. Um, Solana's had insane fee growth driven by insane usage, usage and activity growth. Um, there are, there's more protocols building on Solana now than ever. There's more users on Solana now than ever. Uh, there's more activity in general, right? There's a full fledged DeFi application. You have DEXs, lending, liquid staking being popular. MEV is now a topic. Like there's been this whole expansion and it's not just around DeFi, uh, which is most of the activity on Ethereum today. It's also gaming with Parallel announcing that they're building their part of their protocol uh, in their in their game on Solana. Uh, you have Deepin, like Hive Mapper, Helium, etc. We we it's it's a very rich ecosystem, and that is showing in the on chain activity, which is ultimately pushing these fees higher. And it's very very interesting to see uh, how this will continue to progress because again, we just talked about all the reasons. The first thirty ish minutes of this episode, we're talking about how Solana is broken. And because of that, there is like some inefficiencies uh, around these its transaction processing. Um, and I'm curious to see how this will change going forward. But uh, what are your thoughts on this recent shift in Solana generating meaning, meaningful fee revenue with about you know north of two million dollars per day? Yeah. So I, I made a few posts about this in the past two weeks, and um, the interesting thing that, uh, or the thing I found interesting was. The delta between Ethereum and Solana fees uh, used to be on the orders of like 30x, 50x, 60x. And now it's on the order of like 3x, um, okay, 3 point whatever x. And it actually went down as, uh, as low as 2.8x, right? But it's doing this where Ethereum is doing uh, 12 TPS uh, and Solana is doing obviously much more than that. And... You know, um, w without making any value judgments, the thing that I wanted to point out there was, and by the way, one thing I will note is that people on Solana are overpaying for fees because they falsely think that increasing your fees will increase your chance of landing. That's actually not true um, because the schedule is broken. Um, but, but it does show you market demand and market behavior, which is still interesting nonetheless. And the thing that I find interesting, of course, is as, as you pointed out, uh, the, a, a, a very large foundational building block of the ultrasound narrative was, oh, it's B2B payments. Uh, L2s will pay us a lot of money. This money, these fees will be burned. The token, you know, arbitrarily burned due to inefficiencies will now uh, increase in, in value because there's less supply. It's like, no, that's totally, uh, I, I can't say that word, but it's it's very silly uh, thinking. Um, and... Um, We'll get to kind of base fees in, 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 a, in a bit, but like it also doesn't work, right? Like it, it cannot work long term because you like, and the analogy I used to always use for this was like, okay, I'm going to stick with uh, the steam engine because it burns more energy than like the electric engine. It's like that is such an arbitrary, like ridiculous narrative. Like, at, like at some point you have to realize, wait, this actually solves the problem much better, and. You can still um, make, you know, whatever revenue with that as well, as long as there's usage on chain. And now that there is usage on chain, you can see it in action. Um, and so, and then people like strongly in this and be like, well, I thought like high fees were bad. How come you guys are celebrating high fees? It's like, no, high fees per user are bad. But if you have a, you know, bunch of little fees that add up to high fees overall, do see a lot of activity, independent activity, 
that's a totally separate thing. Okay. Um, and so anyways, that's, that's, um, I do think actually, um, long-term as the, um, the fee mechanisms, um, of, of Solana change because it's kind of up in the air right now. Like there's different fee mechanisms that we can yeah. go with. I do think it's possible that uh, Solana could flip Ethereum in, in, in fees or revenue generated. Um, I, I actually think it's possible. Um, and then the other thing uh, that I was mentioned as a fun fact is I was actually showing the burn as well. Like Solana has a fee burn right. uh, or a token burn and like it like went up exponentially. And I was like, this is like ultrasound salami and whatnot. And like people actually didn't know that Solana, half the priority fees are actually burnt. They actually didn't know this uh, because, you know, we don't put bats and ultrasound symbols on, on Twitter. But like that's Solana actually has the exact same mechanism. Uh, it is going away now. Uh, such that it goes directly all back to the validator so that it doesn't incentivize like side deals to get a share of those fees. Um, but like the half of the base fee will be burnt, which is, again, it's actually pretty similar to Ethereum. The only difference is the the unit uh, economics and margins, right? Like if you can make something super cheap but sell it at scale, that's obviously going to work and it might be better than making stuff very scarce and very expensive. Yeah, I uh, I actually don't hate the ultrasound money narrative. I don't necessarily agree with the... If, if I was the uh, Ethereum brand ambassador, I, I think I would have sold the story a little bit differently. Uh, but the the core ideals behind ultrasound money is having low inflation and yield bearing. And like those are the two stories that get buried in the idea of this ultrasound thing. Like, what the hell does that even mean? Like, I get they played off the Bitcoin story, but I think the infl- inflation... Uh, the the burn mechanism on Ethereum is beautifully designed to burn roughly the same amount of of tokens that were issued in a given year, right? And so that gets you at this like net even um, inflation, and that's you know ranges between one and negative one percent, even tighter than that, honestly, but somewhere in that ballpark. And that's a that's a great story to sell, and I, that's how I would have pushed it in combination with the fact that you get the you stake the you stake ETH, you get a yield, um, and that yield is is beneficial, and it could be this like yield bearing. Um, um, form of money. Uh, I, again, I, I just think that those are the two stories that they should have chose to kind of uh, precipitate out into the world, if you will. Um, and I agree with you that the Solana story isn't all that different, right? When you're running a chain, when you're running a Solana style chain at like a lower TPS because there's not that much activity, yes, the fees look quite bad. And like if you look throughout Solana's history, there hasn't been as much activity as there is today. And so you can kind of see exactly what that story looks like uh, with real data. Uh, but the fact is you continue building and get to the point where you do have that level of activity. And to your point of the lower unit economics uh, with higher scale kind of gets you to a new level. And one of the things that I like that you mentioned was the fact that today priority paying a higher priority fee is no different than paying like any priority fee at all. Uh, so scaling from like 0.1 to, to one soul uh, doesn't make a massive difference in your inclusion guarantees. Um, and so I think that's interesting because Yes, people are probably overpaying today, but if you give users the ability to effectively overpay, like, so let's assume that paying a higher priority fee would get you in, uh, it would increase your inclusion guarantees, your inclusion rate. I would suspect that more people would take full use of that, right? Because there's times where I'm making a transaction and I'm like, I don't need this to be a subset transaction. I need my, I need this included in the next block, right? And like, I'd be willing to pay $5 for that. And I I do think you're going to see some of that change a bit once we, once we hammer out. Um, this fee mechanism and the the networking issues as well as the scheduler issues. Um, so yeah, I uh, I don't think it's crazy to say that Ethereum Solana can flip Ethereum fees. Like I, that has historically been this untouchable number. Uh, but again, I, I don't think that's really crazy with the launch of four eight four four and the increase of activity happening on L twos. And maybe that's a perfect segue to kind of jump into what's happening over there. So um zero x osprey osprey a great friend of both of ours i believe he uh put out a, he's been doing these like daily segments uh shoot i'll try to find this and actually tweet it or post it up but uh he's been posting how th- so base uh, of, all, of all the l2s base has seen the most increase in activity since 4844 went live because of that they uh the way fees work on l2s there are two portions of the fee mechanism one is the, the actual amount that the user must pay or the, the chain itself must pay to get this transaction included on the L1 level. Uh, so to post the uh, transaction data down to Ethereum. And two is like sort of the uh, throttling rate based on the amount of activity happening on the chain. So there's a gas limit for each block. 
Um, and if you're, you know, it's, it's similar to 1559 for the Ethereum L1. Uh, basically, more activity means higher fees. And the second part of that fee, the L2 fee, is kept entirely for the L2 itself. Like Ethereum doesn't see any of that revenue uh, versus the L1 fees, like the cost it actually takes to post back down to Ethereum itself. That is, that is fee revenue for the Ethereum L1 chain itself. And so um, I'll try to pull this up, but if you have the numbers up in front of you, I'd love for you to talk through kind of what, what Osprey has been talking about and, and ultimately what that means for Ethereum's uh, roadmap. Yeah. Um, th- yeah, this goes back to like the fee conversation, right? Uh, Ethereum is actually maybe not making as much in fees as they said they would this whole time. Um, and maybe what needs to happen is L2s need to use ETH as the currency for that chain um, as money. Um, I'm quite skeptical of that as well, to be completely honest, but maybe that's not relevant for, for this conversation. Um, what, what I think will happen uh, and, and what I think this means is I think people are now going to point to Coinbase and they're going to say, hey, look at this L2. They're making so much money. Why don't we also do this, right? So I think people will be like, take they will take Coinbase's example, and I think they will launch their own rollups. And I think this will actually cause um, uh, uh, more people to launch more rollups. But I don't think the UX will improve as fast as that happens. Which is to say, I think that will actually lead to a worse spot overall. Um, and I do think then the general purpose L2s, so like an Arbitrum. And then the general purpose, obviously, all ones like Monad and, and Solana will actually benefit more from this ultimate. That is how I see it playing out. Now, the other part of this that is relatively frustrating for me is, um, and probably much more so for Tolly, is that he kind of said this the whole time. He said, like, it does not matter. Like, you need to improve the hotspots. And base, uh, I believe the fees were upwards of $9 because of the execution not the not the blobs, right? Four eight four four went live. Okay, great. But now the bottleneck is somewhere else, and we actually said that that would be the bottleneck this whole time. Um, and you know now base has to work to to get that fixed. Um, uh, but 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 it's just kind of um, you know people kind of w- would say like, well, four eight four four will make L two scale much fast, m- much better, and that is true. Uh, and it'll make the fees much cheaper, but that part is actually not true, right? Like, and we kind of said this, right? The blob markets, by the way, uh, I'd be curious to see if you have any data on the blob markets and, and how saturated they are, or what, what the mail there looks like. Um, but there's actually now two aspects of this. And I, this is happening before the blob markets are even really saturated, I believe. Um, like people haven't, and, and somebody, um, I saw at a hackathon that somebody is experimenting with uh, blob space inscriptions. So have fun with that. Um, but but uh, this this is going to be a theme that continues to come up. And this is kind of what Solana has been talking about this whole time, which is we need to isolate these, right? Yep, it's, uh, it's coming full circle. And now b- building for execution is incredibly important. Uh, and so the chains that have been doing that are pretty well positioned. And so quickly on your point about uh, blob capacity, uh, as a quick refresher, the target rate for the p- target amount of blobs per block is roughly th- is three. Uh, not roughly, it is three, uh, and the max is six. And so right now we're seeing on the order of about one, then one right around one one blob per block. Um, and you can see who's been posting them, when they're posting them, the frequency of that, and the amount that they're paying. So it's considerably cheaper, uh, but. For context here, so Ethereum in, you know, about a week and a half has cleared, you know, right around, what is that, almost a million dollars uh, in, in blob space revenue. Uh, but if we come quickly look at Celestia, uh, it's funny to see. So, so the, the total, uh, the, the gap in total dollars here is quite staggering because Celestia has been alive for about six months and only cleared 10,000, uh, but has seen a, a significant, uh, significantly more data being posted. Uh, and that's to say, Celestia is still significantly cheaper to post your data to as an L2, um, which is interesting. And of course, like that's not Ethereum's intent. Uh, there's still capacity. Uh, and one more note I want to make on Ethereum really quickly is the, I think it was the founder of Monad, uh, Keon, he had a good thread recently. Maybe we'll put that in the link in the show notes. I encourage everyone to read that as like a where are we at state of L2's post. Um, he did the math and 
TLDR is 4844 supports roughly 300 transactions per second across every L2 that is connected to it. Um, and I think that assumes like perfect efficiency on blob sharing, which is like not how it really works, but let's assume that it is for a second. Solana TPS is, is much higher than that, but if you look at only successful transaction TPS, that is already at about 300. So if for every, all the L2 folk that are you know yelling and screaming about failed transactions, uh, if you only look at successful transaction TPS, Solana is doing about 300, and that is like Ethereum's 4844 capacity, which is, is kind of an interesting metric. And one thing to actually note about the failed transactions is that um, arbitrage transfers are like super computationally heavy in general. Um, and the re w one thing I'll point out to is like during inscription season on Solana, the user TPS with about like a 90 or 80% success rate, like a very high success rate, was over 2,500, right? Because if you have, if uh, 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 user transactions, like actual user transactions, um, uh, the 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 failed transactions actually work against the chain. Like it makes the chain look way worse because those are such heavy uh, transactions. And like if you have very heavy transactions, they're not going to fit too much in the block, right? Because uh, there's only so many compute units that can fit within the block. And so the failed transactions are actually much worse. Like people don't even know how to fud it properly. Like that's that's what I would fud. Um, uh, but yeah, anyway. So it it should be interesting to see. I didn't know that Celestia's revenue was or like fees i guess paid with on the order of ten thousand. uh it's that's only looking less. at uh blob payment uh payments for blobs right so you can like stake your tia there's a fee with that unstake send your tia ibc import to another chain yada yada uh, but only looking at like the core use case of the chain which is of course paying for blobs yes ten thousand dollars year uh launched to date and they launched in late october uh but uh, that's like two things that's a testament to how cheap it is uh, but also there's you know, roughly 15 or so rollups that are actively posting to Celestia today. So their world, their vision is for a world of like, you know, a million rollups and there's 15 today. So um, that's kind of, it's honestly, the thesis there is is abundance. It's not too dissimilar from the Solana thesis um, because, right, the abundant block space, cheap transactions, abundant blob space, cheap posting, right? It's the same concept. Yeah. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, I think just, I don't know. I think it's been interesting how so many of the narratives have kind of converged and um, the path dependence leads to some short-term narratives that don't actually hold weight long-term. And I think we're going to be seeing much more of that. Uh, I think Vitalik obviously has that post with the end game of these things all look relatively similar towards the end. And so it's kind of silly that we argue this much about it. I mean, I'm going to continue to do it, but it is kind of silly. Um, and, uh, obviously you still need to execute to get there. Right. And so it's totally the, you know, says like, well, settlement is super boring to me. All I care about is ex execution. Right. turns out he was right. But also not only just execution of the, of the VM, but actually executing as a, as a, as an ecosystem to keep kind of getting there in the, in the same, uh, that's the only moat you have. Right. Because the economics and stuff, like if somebody does something, uh, uh, for example, 4844, People will just copy that. It's it's all open source software. So since people will just copy everything else, your only moats are really execution and network effects. So anyway. Yeah, it's definitely silly, but it is fun at the very least to compare these things and uh, you know, see what they uh see see how the different approaches lead to maybe even if it's the same end state, it's uh the speed at which you'll get to that end state. Um, and the traction that you'll gain along the way, I think, are, are two, very, very different in, in both approaches. But nonetheless, uh, maybe it's a good place to call it here, Mert. I, another great episode, another fun roundup, and we will be back next week. Cheers.